Good day to you lovely people out there. How is your day going? I pray you are being productive and getting things accomplished. And I pray that this particular newscast, particularly the message that I wanted to give to you today, is going to be something you all really needed to hear. So I hope you'll stick around till the end of this video. So I want to talk briefly about what happened on July 22nd. So I don't know if any of you felt a major shift happen in the spirit world and in the earth, but it almost just shocked me when I, it felt like a huge breakthrough happened that some really good, positive, decision was made or an event took place where a decision was made and it just broke through a bunch of negativity and hostility and I felt this shift happened uh, a few Fridays ago it was definitely the 22nd of July and I felt like walls were being torn down so here recently, I have not been doing as many videos because God has just been, whew, he's just been pummeling me with wisdom and knowledge and understanding and so much has been opened up to me and I've had to reset how I view my life and what I'm doing here like on social media and where my future is going. And since this breakthrough or this shift in the earth and in heaven took place a few weeks ago, like, I don't know about you all, but something really weird has happened. And I can't quite explain it, but it's like my path in life has just did a 90 degree turn. And I am now headed down this new path. I've already started a second book and I have more pages than I had written in the first book. That took me two years and over the last probably week and a half, I've, I've got more pages than my first book has. So there is a lot of stuff going on right now. And it's not just me, I'm witnessing this in other Christians' lives and it was almost as if the body of Christ got a green light. So here recently, I have been drawn to, what is his name, Robert Henderson. He wrote a series of books called The uh, Courts of Heaven. And my mind just <laughs> exploded the last few days because this has been a godsend. He has been a huge blessing to my life because while I am on this new path and I am getting an alignment with it, things around me are just coming together incredibly fast. Like things are working <laughs> for a change instead of me breaking everything or, you know, messing stuff up. You know, you just get into these funks and you just don't know why everything is not working in your favor. Well, that's gone. I, I'm pretty sure that most of you who listen to this channel have noticed something in your life the last few weeks have rapidly been changing for the better. So while I was watching Robert Henderson's videos, he mentioned a very important piece of information that really kind of tied in my place in God's kingdom and also the body of Christ's place in the kingdom. So there's two facets to this. The first facet, he said, was that there is a prophecy, and I don't know where this came from or who spoke it. Obviously, God told someone to say it, but there is this prophecy of a billion saved souls, a billion saved souls, that is about to take place. And as soon as he said it, my mind, the spirit 
pointed me directly to Revelation chapter 7, an innumerable company of saints in heaven, innumerable, meaning that you can't count them. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Amen. So, understanding this has really... Like I said, it switched my path, and now I'm like headed down a new path, and it's becoming very straight and narrow, mind you, literally to the point where I am guarding every T that I cross and every dot I make above the I. So, and it's almost as if the body of Christ is about ready to experience something very similar because the saints, um, basically in the book of Revelation, they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Yeshua. Now, for many years, many uh, teachers and preachers and all of that talked about a revival, a massive revival coming. And I have to agree with them on this because as I've been pouring over scripture these last few weeks, a great event is about to take place in the world. The children of Israel are going to remember who they were and their tribes they were associated with. So he talked about Robert Henderson talked about three things that keeps our prayers from not being answered and it prevents us from actually getting anything accomplished for the kingdom of God or in our life, our daily life. And that one is sin, two is transgression, and three is iniquity. So sin is your intent and transgression is about activity that you do in the world. And in iniquity, he said, this sin is what came from your bloodline. These are the generational curses that uh, we find in old, the Old Testament. But, you know, Yeshua did say that each soul would, each individual is going to die for their own sins. Um, they don't die for their fathers and all that sins. He stopped all of that apparently back in that day. But as you begin to explore your bloodline, your family line, and you start seeing some terrible things that had went on, you can actually be in a position to have God reveal those to you by praying for that. And then you can repent on their behalf. And then that gives you freedom to go into the courts of heaven to plead your case and fight against the accuser, the prosecutor who is constantly bringing us before God and trashing us in the courts of heaven. So this has a huge deal with this event that's coming with all of the tribes of Israel coming back into the land of Israel. And this is prophesied to happen during the tribulation period. And the 144,000 are going to be taken out of this. They're going to be marked and they're going to do their testimony and their preaching. And folks, I think this is going to start happening very, very quickly because time is getting really short if you're not aware of it already. Now, the second part of this is the ecclesia, the called out ones, okay? That's what we are. We are made kings and priests in this earth so that we can go before the Almighty in heaven in his courts, obviously in the spirit, to be able to defend our case, to be able to, and that by honestly realizing and knowing what your part in the kingdom of God is, 
I mean, if you don't know it at this point, you need to go in prayer to the Lord and ask him to reveal your position in his kingdom for you. So you can start acting upon it now because now is the time and there is going to be a huge wave of people that are just going to glorify the Lord on the earth. And you definitely want to be a part of this. So recognize this position you are already in. So God has, before he made you in this earth, there is a scroll or a book written in heaven about you. And in it is everything that God had planned for you. Then you were born into the earth and, you know, sin and transgression and all this stuff comes in. We've got to deal with this. And because there's not a lot of good teachers out there right now, I mean, there are some, but they're hard to find. But when you do find them, consider yourself blessed because they're going to help you remember who you are so that you can act appropriately in your position, your function when you go into God's courts in heaven and I'm going to throw a third thing in there, too. And we're going to talk about garments. Very, very important to wear the right garments. If your garments are stained, tattered, or dirty, you will not be allowed to go into the courts of heaven. You have to have certain clothing that qualifies you to step into the courts of heaven and function in that place so they can present cases on behalf of the people of God. So think about it. Psalms 45, why is the quote unquote bride or queen clothed in the gold of Ophir? She has a very powerful position. And so she is clothed with that honor because she is glorifying her maker. Okay, I'll talk more about this later. I just wanted to throw that out there because I'm kind of getting really excited about this stuff. It's also daunting because it's so big and I can't really wrap my head around it quite yet. Um, but it's going to involve a lot of people, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So pray for this. Uh, go to God and discern this message that you just heard and make sure that you're getting, you know, feedback from the Father in heaven and Yeshua to see what role in part you're playing this all out in. So, all right, the news today is going to be short because I've got a lot of spiritual things I want to be talking about instead, but I have a few freaking weird, <laughs> these are weird articles, okay? This is straight out of the New World Agenda. This is straight out of Satan's mind to control humanity. This is kind of creepy, folks. Even the wording in the title should say it all. So at NPR, they put out an article the other day by Bill Chappelle. And it says a 105 mile long city will snake through the Saudi desert. Is this a good idea? This thing is Kind of creepy looking. I'm going to provide this link in the description box below because I want to share this one and I'm not going to close it up on Patreon like I do my other stuff because I want everybody to really understand that we're getting towards the end of the end of days right now. It's getting really close. It looks like a tall and narrow strip of a city more than 105 miles long, teeming with 9 million residents and running entirely on renewable energy. That's the vision Saudi Arabia's leaders have for the line. That's what they're calling this monstrosity of a structure. It's part of a giga project that will reshape the kingdom's northwest. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. Newly revealed design concepts show a futuristic walled city. Its open interior is enclosed 
on both sides by a mirrored facade stretching from the Red Sea eastwards across the desert and into a mountain range. Details are emerging about this monolithic city. The new stats and designs revealed Monday include, that's this past Monday, not Monday, August 1st, when you're listening to this, it will be only 200 meters wide, roughly 220 yards. That's not very wide, folks. It will rise 500 meters above sea level, which is higher than the Empire State Building. Residents will be able to run errands with a five-minute walk. There will be no cars or roads. High-speed rail will carry people from end to end within 20 minutes. It will cost hundreds of billions of dollars to build, and construction has already began. This Saudi pro project is calling for 1.5 million people to live in what they're calling the line I catch it. It's the World Economic Forum right here, 2030. The line is going to be completely operational by 2030. The unconventional megacity is part of the government's ambitious NEOM development project, which released conceptual videos showing the city high walls and closing trees, gardens, and other plant lives, nestling communities among work and recreational structures. There's even a video here that you can watch of this monstrosity. Basically, they're going to be pushing people into these tiny little cubicles. That's where you're going to live, and you're going to live on top of each other. They're going to be able to maintain the ideal climate year-round thanks to its mix of shades, sunlight, and ventilation. And um, one commenter wrote in a reply to the video that's posted there, and I think it says it all. One of the commenters says, I've never seen something more dystopian. <laughs> and for those of you who do not know the definition for dystopian it means relating to or denoting an imagined state or society where there is great suffering or injustice so for all those years that all the truthers even alex jones were talking about putting mankind into mega cities literally boxing them into tiny spaces like sardines it's coming to pass folks they're doing it. I suspect that there are plans here in America that have been decades in the making, and they're going to slowly start revealing these plans even in America. So watch for that to happen soon. So in other news, with all that is going on in the world today, I pray that you are preparing in the best way that you can, even if it means that you need to get a second job just to be able to grab those things that you're going to need as the squeeze on the economy continues to tighten as we approach the fall and into the winter scene. Europe is going to be hating it. Um, I feel so bad and I am continuing to pray for the people in Europe right now. They are caught between a rock and a hard place, literally, and they're going to be suffering very greatly. Um, especially for those who did not prepare, you know. So this is another warning for you to go out there and prepare as best you can. What do you need to prepare? You need water, food, clothing, and warmth <laughs> as you need it. I mean, obviously, summer's here. You're not thinking about getting a wood burning stove or thinking about buying cords of woods when it's 109 degrees outside, but you still need to prepare for what's coming because if the electricity goes down and if it goes down for a substantial long time and it's in the middle of winter, how are you going to keep warm? How are you going to keep your family warm? How are you going to cook food how are you going to use the bathroom? You know, if your your systems aren't working anymore, you need to come up with new systems in order for you to persevere. For me, I followed uh, Doug and Stacy's. Uh, they did a video several years ago where they showed their 
system of how to deal with their human ore. <laughs> so yes, that's exactly what it is. It is human manure. And they have a bucket system that they use and they use uh, pine shavings to cover the smell. It works perfectly, folks. I've been using it since this past winter when my electricity went down and I couldn't get water out of the spigot. I couldn't, you know, use my toilet or anything. So it actually worked. And I've also found an area where I can go and dump my sewage ethically and it will be able to break down into the matter that it was, that it is, and it will become dirt again at one point. Although I won't be using that dirt for my food, I may use it on trees and shrubs and things like that, you know, flowering plants, but uh, I have a way that I don't need electricity so that I can take care of that system of my life. And right now I'm making plans to further that because now I'm going to be able to have access to a high tunnel, a greenhouse, and to be able to grow my own food, I'm going to be separating my waste and I'm going to be using the urine for specifically for nitrogen for the plants. And there's a formula for it. If you're interested in that stuff, you can email me or uh, yeah, just email me or put a comment in the comment section below and I'll give you the formula for that. The ratio of how much urine to water to put on plants so that they're getting the nitrogen that they need and then also the calcium from potash and things like that that you can make yourself actually. It's simple and easy. It's just a little time consuming. And then obviously the number two, that gets dealt with and turned back into dirt. So uh, along with these systems, energy prices are going to go absolutely nuts this winter. There is already right now, I'm hearing rumors that there are so many people that are unable to pay for their electricity. What happens, and I'm talking millions and millions of people right now are unable to make their energy bills right now. And it, this is just the start of the recession, folks. Um, I could even say it's it's in the depression, but we won't go there quite yet. Anyway, what's going to happen this winter when energy prices are going crazy? Will the energy um, companies start shutting people off from electricity? Um, what are we going to see happening? As every nation on the earth is now being plunged into a horrifying international economic crisis. Last year, my energy bills went up to over $200 and I was shocked. I was like, I am one person living in a small space and I'm paying over $200. I started turning off uh, electricity. I started unplugging everything from the wall outlets. I even went to the junction box and I started turning everything off there that I was not using. If there was outlets on the north side of the place I live, I turned all those off and because I've got stuff on the south side that I can use. And then I was able to get my energy consumption that was just like, it's, it was like leaving the water running and your bill just keeps going and going up higher and higher. And if you can turn that off, you can save so much of wasted energy and you can save on your pocketbook. I was able to get my energy bills down below $100. So that definitely helped a lot this last winter. But what happens if our power bills this winter go up by 50%? I mean... You think about it, it's just electricity, guys. It There's nothing more that goes into it or comes out of it. It is what it is. But yet, they're raking in billions and billions of dollars by doing these increases, and it's going to start hurting everyone. Russians have been trying to use energy as a leverage against Europe, and on Monday they announced that the amount of natural gas flowing through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline will be reduced to just 20% of its capacity. That, that's getting scary, folks. 
In essence, Vladimir Putin is turning the screws and it may just be a matter of time before he cuts off the gas completely. Europeans should have never allowed themselves to become so dependent on mankind, on Russia energy. Now they're facing a crisis and now they don't know what to do about it. So they're scrambling and anger is rising. And what happens if, you know, all of this starts crumbling, not just in Europe, but now in Argentina, the government is collapsing. People refuse to work amid major subsidy cuts. Protests have erupted in Buenos Aires over the last 90 days, and they continue to build inside of the capital as residents battle with their center-left government over sizable amendments to social programs. The 10 kings that are rising upon the world right now, and yes, they are forming nation, how shall I say this, national borders are going to be dissolved everywhere. These 10 kings are going to come in and pull all these people groups together. And that's it, folks. Then it's off to the races, to the seven-year tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist, the harpazo of the Bride of Christ. I mean, it's all lining up right now. I want to give two other stories that are huge and it just shows you how close we are. I never really understood. I always understood that there were fake Christians and that there were true Christians. And what it means to be a Christian is a follower of Christ. And Yeshua told us that we would know them by their fruits. Well, some quote unquote Christians are really showing their fruits and um, it's... Yeah, I'll let you decide. Christian school students say they felt pressure to play along with drag show at chapel service. Is this really happening in a chapel? It was. It happened at the Grace Church in Manhattan. Students reportedly felt pressured to play along after their Austin's Billy Christian high school turned its mandatory chapel service into a drag show earlier this year. In remarks made to the post-millennial on conditions of anonymity, students said there were tons of pressure to act approvingly about a drag queen performance and to pretend like it was normal. The controversial event was hosted in April by Grace Church School in downtown Manhattan, an independent Episcopalian school centered around Manhattan's historic 1808 Episcopalian Church. The school serves roughly 800 students from pre-K through 12th grade and states it's committed to inclusion, diversity, and anti-racism. Students who attended the Grace Church are required to go to chapel services at the Gothic-style church once a week through 8th grade and every other week through high school. On April 27th, students reportedly felt pressured to dance and play along when drag queen and LGBT activist Jesse Havia, who goes by the stage name Britta Filter, weird, made a surprise appearance during the chapel service, dancing up the aisle in exaggerated and vulgar attire as rows of mass students in the pews applauded. Folks, if this was a real house of God, do you think he would have stood for this? I don't know, folks. This is getting out there weird. So as uh, we descend even beyond the horrific and disgusting Sodom and Gomorrah, we definitely are getting worse and worse by the day. The last article, this is truly what I've been talking about for a decade or longer. In these end of days, the harvest of your genetic material is the number one, how shall I say this? It's the number one item for sale. In the entire earth, I think it's probably even more profitable than gold itself. 
if we could know as individuals how much our DNA is being sold on the open market and the data of our DNA, I think we would be astounded as to how many people have access to our genetic information. So this out of Whitehead, your DNA is in the lineup at the genetic panopticon. And there's a reason for this, and it's tied directly to the mark of the beast. Headlines about DNA are everywhere. Military labs are collecting DNA for genetic warfare, and it's coming. Look at what happens in Ezekiel chapter 39. They are in suits, and they have signs posted everywhere telling people, if you come across a dead body, don't touch it, right? So genetic warfare... Law enforcement collects DNA for criminal identification. The UN is building a universal DNA database on all species on Earth. And synthetic DNA is being created from computer modeling. It's a dystopian DNA panopticon. Justice Antonin Scalia, um, dissenting in the Maryland versus King, he quoted as saying, solving unsolved crimes is a noble objective, but it occupies a lower place in the American pantheon of noble objectives than the protection of our people from suspicionless law enforcement searches. Make no mistake about it, your DNA can be taken and entered into a national DNA database if you are ever arrested rightly or wrongly, and for whatever reason, perhaps the construction of such a genetic panopticon is wise, but I doubt that the proud men who wrote the charter of our liberties would have been so eager to open their mouths for royal inspection. Be warned, this is, these DNA detectives are now on the prowl, folks. We're going to get into the, the message part of this newscast about generational curses. We're going to talk about your family's issues. And let me tell you, whatever skeletons may be lurking on your family tree or in your closet, whatever crimes you may have committed, whatever associations you may have with those on the government's most wanted list, the police state is determined to ferret them out. This last article goes hand in hand with the message I'm going to give after I read this article. And I'm telling you that the systems that are in place right now and the fervency that is being addressed to collect all of this information is so that Satan can produce a case against you in the courts of heaven. Everything is being revealed. Every sin, transgression, and iniquity is being laid out on the table right now to prosecute as many human beings in the courts of heaven as possible. Stick around if you want to learn the truth about all this. You're going to get a real dose of truth here in just a few minutes. So no longer can we consider ourselves innocent until proven guilty. Now we are all suspects in a DNA lineup waiting to be matched up with a crime. This is also going hand in hand with pre-crime theory, where they prosecute somebody and convict them before they even committed the crime. DNA technology in the hands of government officials will complete our transition to a surveillance state, the in which the prison walls are disguised within the seemingly benevolent trappings of technology and scientific progress, national security, and the need to guard against terrorists, pandemics, civil unrest, etc. By accessing your DNA, the government will soon know everything else about you that they don't already know, your family chart, your ancestry, what you look like, your health history, your inclinations, your ability to follow orders, to chart your own course in life, your beliefs, and eventually they're going to know how you think. It's getting harder to hide these things. And eventually you're not going to be able to hide these things anymore. 
Now, I understand that some of this technology is used for good, especially solving cold cases that have remained unsolved for decades. This has been able, it's a huge game changer to give the police the ability to solve crimes. And that's, you know, for a lot of families, that's bringing justice to families that had to have dealt with unsolved cases of their loved family members and their murders and things of that nature. So, but there is the dark side of this now. By submitting your DNA to a genealogical database such as Ancestry and 23andMe, you're giving the police access to your genetic makeup, relationships, and health profiles to every relative, past, present, and future. And I think there's even the deeper, darkest side of all of this. And I'm going to go there, folks. This is what IBM did with um, the Jews in World War II, how they were able to distinguish their family lines and to be able to round those people up specifically. But this time, they're going to be able to do it so efficiently that I believe... All right, hear me out. This is my two cents. The reason for these databases, these DNA genealogical databases to be formed, and the reason why so many people in the world are now coming to the realization that they are a part of the 12 tribes of Israel is going hand in hand. While all of this has good attached with it because now you know your bloodline lineage. You know where you came from. You can get through all of the lies and the garbage that has held down your family for generations. Now you can know where you came from and where your tribe is from, where your lineage is from. The dark side of this is now they can segregate anybody they want to and put them in select concentration camps. And from there, they can conduct their medical experiments on those specific DNA, DNA patterns and come up with novel bioweapons and use them in warfare, which is coming, folks. And realize that it no longer even matters if you're among the tens of millions of people who have added their DNA to the Ancestry databases Brian Resnick reports public DNA databases have grown so massive that they can be used to find you even if you never shared your own DNA. Math ma mathematicians have basically figured it out, and this was quite a few years ago, that you know everybody else in the world by six people. That's it. And that's probably even shortened now. It's probably like five people. So if... These databases know all the six people around you. They know who you are. <laughs> I mean, it is just that simple. So while I read to you about the Scallion's quote of Maryland versus King, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Maryland versus King that taking DNA samples from a suspect does not violate the Fourth Amendment. The court's subsequent decision to let stand the Maryland's Court of Appeals ruling in Raynor versus Maryland, which essentially determined that individuals do not have a right to privacy when it comes to their DNA, made Americans even more vulnerable to the government accessing and analyzing and storing their DNA without their knowledge or permission. It's been downhill since then. The government has been relentless to getting a hold of your DNA, either through mandatory programs carried out in connection with law enforcement in corporate America by warrantlessly accessing your familial DNA shared with genealogical services such as Ancestry and 23andMe. Get ready, folks, because the government has embarked on a di diabolical campaign to create a nation of suspects predicated on a massive national DNA database. This has been helped along by Congress, which has adopted legislation allowing police to collect and test DNA immediately following the arrest, President Trump, who signed the Rapid DNA Act into law, 
The courts, which have ruled that police can routinely take DNA samples from people who are arrested but not yet convicted of a crime, and local police agencies, which are chomping at the bit to acquire this new crime-fighting gadget, such as DNA machines, which are portable and the size of a desktop printer, all 50 states now maintain their own DNA government databases, although the protocols for collection differ from state to state. Increasingly, many of the data from local data banks are being uploaded to CODIS, CODIS, the FBI's massive DNA database, which has become a de facto way to identify and track the American people from birth to death. Even hospitals have now gotten in on the game by taking and storing newborn babies' DNA without the parents' knowledge or consent. I remember when I had my son, I watched them and they took a 25 long inch cut of my cord. Um, they tied it off in several places and it was about a little over two feet and all of that cord contained stem cells, right? That's what I initially thought they were taking my umbilical cord for. They didn't even ask me. They just took it. They did ask me, however, when I passed the afterbirth, whether or not I wanted to keep it, which is gross, but some people actually eat that stuff, not me. But I should have told them no, because they did ask me about that, but they did not ask me to if I would allow them to take the blood in my umbilical cord. They just took it without me saying yes. So... Since 2011, I've been talking about this stuff for a very long time. So while this article is very disturbing, we know that it's happening. I've also done articles about how China is purchasing a lot of our DNA information from certain companies that collect and process our DNA information. They literally are not going through the FBI themselves, but they're going through the smaller companies that feed into the FBI's database system. So it's, it's becoming very real. And I think this is a timely article because of what I've got to talk about here at the end of this newscast. Wrapping up the news, I want to talk again about Robert Henderson and his uh, series of books that he wrote, Courts of Heaven. They were so amazing. If you have ever listened to this guy, he is like legit. This guy is the one, I mean, you can see it in his eyes. He is on fire for the Lord and the Lord is using him in a very powerful way. And I'm grateful that God has brought me to his videos because I have learned so much just in the last few days. Much of this I did not know, and I'm assuming that a lot of you all don't know this as well. So here it goes. Three things that our adversary can bring a legal case against us in the courts of heaven, which prevents our prayers from being answered and blessings to be poured out upon the righteous. The first is sin. That is your intent. Two is transgression. That is about your activity, what you're doing in the world. And three, this is a big one, iniquity. This is the sin that's in your bloodline, your generational bloodline, whom you've come from. And it is a generational curse. There are four things about iniquity that you need to know. And yes, all of these, for me, I had always just assumed that sin and transgression and iniquity were kind of all wrapped up in kind of the same thing, but they are literally not. <laughs> they have their own standard of category that the Lord uses to pass judgments upon. Iniquity is the big one because you can't, go and fix, um, you know, a hundred generations ago, you can't go fix the wrongs that they committed in their lives. But through learning these four things you can do, you may actually have a legal right to stand up for your past 
family. So the four caveats to iniquity are one, iniquity gives the legal right to tempt me or us in a given area. Almost all strongholds come from an iniquitous root. Number two, iniquity will fashion your identity. Let me repeat that. That's very important. Iniquity will fashion your identity and the way you think about yourself if you let it. Isaiah chapter 6 talks about woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Iniquity undealt with will fashion your identity. Isaiah had his iniquity purged. He went from one who was worthy to be destroyed to one who was worthy to be a prophet of Yahweh. How did this happen? Well, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 6, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am. Send me. Once Isaiah had his iniquity purged, he went from one who was worthy to be destroyed to one who was worthy to be a prophet for Yahweh. Number three, iniquity undealt with will detour you from your destiny. Psalms 139 verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Before you existed on the earth, you were a scroll. You were written in a book in heaven. The enemy uses the iniquity in our bloodline to pull us off course from the destiny Yahweh wrote for us in our book in heaven. Number four, iniquity is used by the enemy to build cases against us in the courts of heaven. Second Samuel chapter 21, we find David going before the Lord and asking why there was famine in the land for three years. And David asked God to heal the land, but God told David that Saul broke the covenant with the Gibeonites by killing them 70 years prior. David had to give over the sons of Saul to be hanged by the Gibeonites, sparing Mephibosheth who was the son of Jonathan, and God healed the land absolutely immediately after the last person was hanged. And you can see that because in verse, verse 10, and you see that in verse 10, after the beginning of the harvest, until water dropped upon them from out of heaven, upon them out of heaven. So those are the four, because you have been praying prayers for a long time, and if you're finding that they're not being answered, it's because something legal is standing in your way. The only way you can do this, and I'm going to explain more of this, is to clean up your garments. You have to clean up your act, and you have to be presentable when you go before the Lord God Almighty. Let's look at Luke 18. Get everything in legal order and the answers come speedily. This helps us to come into a, a third dimension of prayer that helps us get the breakthrough. How do we do this? So you have to have a history with God, with Yahweh. Crying day and night to him gets our breakthrough faster. 
when you are constantly going before him in prayer and you are laying your entire life down before him, cleaning out those sins in the darkest parts of your heart and mind and having a right standing relationship with the one true God, you can look at this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. Having obtained a good testimony, all those listed in Hebrews 11, which is called the faith chapter for a reason, it's the hall of faith, um, they had a good testimony or a status in heaven. If you have a good testimony, you have a good influence in the spirit realm. You have a good status in heaven. All those brave men and women listed in Hebrews 11 are part of the great cloud of witnesses that are always before the Lord in heaven. This means those who give judicial testimony, even those who lay their life down like Yeshua did. If you want to have more authority in the courts of heaven, it will cost you. You will have to lay your life down. Now, this doesn't mean death, like physical death. Not most of the time. Sometimes we are required to lay our lives down for our friends or other people we love. But it could be some small sacrifice in your life that would actually give you the opportunity to sacrifice yourself so that something greater can come out of you. And this kind of sacrifice is not something that is, you know, just a piffle little thing. No, it's really got to hurt you. <laughs> and it hurts bad, trust me. Especially if you're laying your life down for family members who have no idea what you just did for them. But the Lord looks upon your sacrifice, sees your tears and your broken heart, and he honors you for that. Amen. So let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. Now, this one really blew me away in the video I was watching with Robert Hender Henderson, and it almost just smacked me across the face. It's like the light immediately turned on. It's like, that's it. This is exactly how this is going to play out. So I've always said um, through the numerous years I've been doing this on YouTube, that the man-child found in Revelation chapter 12 is not Jesus. This is not a story about Mary, the virgin, and, and bearing Jesus. It has nothing to do with that or the children of Israel. It has everything to do with the harpazo and the rapture of the bride of Christ, the entourage of Christ, the bridesmaids of Christ. It has everything to do with this group of people that are going to heaven for the marriage ceremony. And this brought up some very interesting thoughts, and I'll get to those maybe a little bit later on here. But first, I want to talk about the accuser in verses 10 and 11. In the Greek, it's kategor, or it's called a prosecutor. It's Strong's Concordance G2723, and it means against one in the assembly or a complaint at law. It literally is Satan complaining and using the law to prosecute people in the courts of heaven. So the only way to overcome our adversary is by the blood of the lamb. That's Yeshua HaMashiach. And that's what the people, the woman who stays behind, remember the man child gets caught up to the throne of God. He gets caught up into the courtroom of God. And then the woman, the rest of the church, the lazy Laodiceans that are asleep at the wheel, they finally get their butts burned and they start to wake up. And that's when you get the, the great multitude of people. This could be the billion people prophecy that turned to Christ here very soon. They're the ones who are fleeing into the wilderness, and they're the ones who are giving their testimony. They were, they were spared by the blood of the Lamb. And in verse 11, and they gave the word of their testimony of him. These people have an authority in heaven because they laid their lives down. Look at what goes on in Revelation chapter 6 
and chapter 14. In chapter 6, we see the fifth seal being opened. And under the altar are the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they did cry unto the Lord and, and with a loud voice even saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. We see also in Revelation chapter 14, we see finally the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and on Mount Zion, it's literally talking about his governmental mountain, and they are in heaven when this is happening, and the 144,000 are with him in heaven. So we watch them all get basically raptured at the three and a half year mark in Revelation chapter 11. We see them in chapter 14 surrounding the Lamb on Mount Zion. And for those who are still on the earth, here is the patience of the saints. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So amazing, folks. I mean, just look at what's going on in the rest of the chapter there. You've got uh, the Son of God, the Son of Man, sitting on the white cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And, you know, there's angels coming out of the temple and crying with loud voice and things are happening. So the accuser... And going back to chapter 12, the accuser, whatever happens, okay, this is where I'm going to diverge a little bit and kind of give you a, my little thoughts on this, my little two cents. So we're going to start getting into family, what that really means and why it's being so viciously attacked by these Satanists, these evil, wicked people out in the world today um, who just want to murder everything and everyone in their sight. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, we see that there was war in heaven. This happens almost immediately after the man-child is raptured into heaven. We know this because the prophets of old talked about this as well. Well, a lot of it came from David, King David, I should say. In Psalms 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. So I have said previously that there is going to be a wedding in heaven. It's different from the banquet that's going to happen when Christ comes back to the earth. And, you know, there's just total carnage that goes on and all the wicked are dead. And this is the feast of the Lord after the wedding takes place. But the wedding takes place in heaven. And the invitation for that is the time for you to respond is rapidly running out. You must RSVP ASAP, if you know what I mean. And the only way to do that is start repenting of your sins, cleaning the inside of your cup and the outside of your cup, meaning your heart, you need to start cleaning up your thoughts, cleaning up your mouth. You need to start cleaning your garments. You need to be presentable when you go before the king in heaven and to be a part of his wedding. Now, here's my little two cents on this. God says in Daniel 
very soon I am going to shake both the heavens and the earth. This is literally what this event is looking forward to, is shaking the heavens. There is going to be so much shaking in the heavens that the great dragon, which is Satan, is cast out with his angels forever. They will never, ever be able to go before the Almighty ever again. Praise Yahweh. And I believe, now this is just my take, this is my two cents, I can't back this up scripturally, but I think that the devil and his angels are so loathfully jealous of Yeshua marrying his bride and that this, this anger and this hatred goes back to Genesis 6 when those angels came down from out of heaven. They left their estate, as Jude tells us, and they went to go have intercourse. They knew the women of the sons of men. They took them wives, all of which they chose, and they created giants out on the earth. Now, everyone from Joshua to David were killing these giants, the Rephaim and all this, back in the day, um, all throughout their time in ancient Israel. They were literally taking out these remnants of this, this encounter, this excursion against mankind. Because not only were there giants before the flood, there were giants also after the flood. So the problem with angels mating with humans is because, well, their souls are not like our souls. They can't, their souls can't go anywhere. That's why we have demons here on the earth. There's nowhere for them to go. They wander the earth for thousands and thousands of years. And you can imagine how bitter and hate-filled that they probably are by now. Now, these angels that sired these giants, some of them still have access to heaven and they've sided with Satan. And this war could potentially be about the son of man, the son of God, marrying his bride. It's totally about a family issue. Why are we seeing so many attacks against the family? We've seen... Just a few days ago, Michigan Governor Whitmer deletes pro-life programs from the state budget, and she is smiling from ear to ear. She is so adamant to kill our babies, murder them, that she would probably take them by the neck and fling them around and kill them herself if she could. What disgusting people they are. Murderous people have murder in their hearts. And they better repent before the Lord God returns. Whoo, they are in trouble. Their souls are in trouble. And we, we, body of Christ, need to keep these people in our prayers so that they can have a chance to be saved. Even a chance. So back to my two cents, Isaiah chapter two, verse two, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. Now, when it talks about mountains in the Bible, generally it is speaking about government. It is speaking to Rosh which is a governmental head. And mountain also is house. It is the governmental head of a house, which is family. God is telling us, I'm going to have a family, a house that functions as government and they will release judicial order that will cause all the other mountains of the earth to come into divine order and underneath that influence. You, now catch this folks, you cannot be a government until you have or become a family. 
Psalms 45 rapture anybody? <laughs> so I theorize the war in heaven of Revelation chapter 12 is the re direct result of the rapture of the bride of Christ who will marry Yeshua and birth the family that God is making. Um, would like to hear your comments on this because I know it's a big stretch. It's out there. But this is what the Lord has been showing me, and I cannot keep silent about it because it's super exciting. Because we see the world trying to destroy families all over the nations of the earth. It's not just happening in America or Australia. This is happening in every nation of the earth right now because the wicked hate families. They hate government. They hate Yahweh's government. Okay, let's talk about Zechariah chapter 3. What is Yeshua's primary function in heaven? He is functioning right now as high priest. He is technically not yet been crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That title still belongs to the God of this earth. That would be Satan, unfortunately. But his time is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. High priest is a legal position, the highest position in the courts of heaven, other than the God who judges all. Because of what Yeshua did on the cross by laying his life down for all of his friends, his blood is speaking, his blood covers, his blood is able to heal. Heal. Yeshua's blood gives the legal right for God Almighty to forgive us. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and verse 24. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Catch this, verse 24, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. When the Bible tells us that we are priests, we are dealing with a with the spiritual legal battles in heaven. The priests did what was legally needed so God Almighty could bless the people. When Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead, he was functioning as the high priest here on earth undoing all the things that legally put Satan in a position to take Lazarus's life prematurely. Then, when Yeshua stands in Lazarus's tomb, he makes his kingly decree, Lazarus, come forth. He could do this based on his works, undoing all the legality that bound Lazarus and could boldly declare his life to be returned to him. Yeshua belongs to the Melchizedek order. It is an order of kings and priests. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, when Yeshua comes back, he is coming to judge and to make war. He is no longer acting in the function of a high priest. He is acting as a king ready to take his kingdom back. When Yeshua comes in Revelation chapter 19, he is going to set judicial things in order. Then when order is established, he is going to step out on the battlefield to make war. Did you ever ask yourself, why does Satan hate us so much? I know I've pondered that for years and years and years. What could I possibly do to someone like him? And not just because it's the very existence that I occupy here on the earth. Satan hates us because we have access to the mountain he used to have access to. He used to be in a place and a position that we now occupy. Folks, 
if that is not a golden nugget for you right now, and if you do not know how to take your position that you were made for this, you better go before the Lord right now. I mean, get on your knees and you better ask God, tell me my job in your kingdom, Father. Yahweh is literally telling us, I want you to recognize where you are and begin to function in this place. There is a spiritual dimension that we deal with. Mount Zion is that spiritual dimension. It's in there. We see it in places like Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16, where we see him walking Satan upon the mountain of the Lord and up and down in the stones of fire. We now have access to that. Folks, what are you doing? We've got to get going. We've got stuff to do. We've got to get our clothing. We've got to get cleaned up. We've got to get law abiding. We've got to learn what the law is. We've got stuff we got to be doing, folks. We got to be praying and repenting for iniquity, sin, and transgressions. Prayer, prayer, prayer is so important right now because there's coming a time where we will not be using this tool as much anymore. Think about this. Right now, prayer is our biggest tool in our tool chest. It is the universal tool that we can use against our enemies. Right now, Yeshua, our high priest, is using our prayers, doing legal battle in heaven, standing as mediator, you know, our defending attorney, and he is protecting us. He is healing us. He is getting us breakthroughs. But there's coming a time when Yeshua will come as a king in Revelation chapter 19. He is going to set judicial things in order. Then when order is established, he is going to step out on the battlefield to make war. Know this. Yeshua never puts prayer on a battlefield, but he puts it into the courtroom. Before we make war, make sure we have all our judicial house in order. Otherwise, if you challenge the devil in heaven while he still has a legal right, you're going to get backlash against you and you're probably going to get smacked down. If you challenge the devil while he still has a legal, legal right to do what he is doing, he has a right to backlash against you. So what do we have to do? We have to know what the judicial order is. We have to be acting upon this judicial house and its order. And the only way to do that is to learn the laws of Yahweh. Folks, this is, I've been talking about this stuff for years and it just like all came together two days ago when I started watching Robert Henderson's videos. I was just like, everything makes sense now. I mean, I got so much backlash from all these Christians out there who keep saying, we're not under the law, we're under grace and blah, 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 blah. That's great. I'm a product of grace. So are you. Be thankful for that. I'm grateful for that because without it, we can't have access to God. The other point of this is, is that the law is not going away, folks. You have to have laws. They're going to have to have laws at the millennial end when the great white throne judgment takes place because people still have to be judged by those laws, by the books, because they get opened and judgment comes. If you take away the law, you take away judgment, you take away justice and righteousness. It does not work. So I've presented here to the best of my ability a message that I wanted to let everyone know about. This really touched me to the core of my heart and my mind and my soul and my spirit and I knew I have so much more work now to do. 
And I heard Yahweh say to me here recently within the last few days that he's opening doors for me that is going to lead me to higher places. And I have no idea what that even looks like. So I'm just kind of throwing this out there for all of you. I don't know where I'm going, what I'm going to be doing. I'm hoping to bring you along for the ride and I'm hoping you're enjoying the ride with me because it, it's kind of exciting. It's exciting to know your place in his kingdom and that you actually have the tools and the resources you need to act upon your position in his kingdom. Isn't that awesome? So folks, I pray and hope that this message has blessed you. It blessed me so much. I know it's going to bless you all. Even those of you who want to still cling to the law is dead and done away with at the cross and all that stuff, all that nonsense. Stop believing in the lies that Satan puts off because he doesn't want you to have the power to know about the courts of heaven right now, okay? That's one of the biggest lies in Christianity right now, and we have to overcome that because Satan's using that crap against us in the courts of heaven right now. So I just thought I would drop that off. <laughs> okay, I love you all very dearly. Pray for each other. Keep praying unceasingly, folks. It's happening. Something big is coming. And it's a mixture of both the wicked working in big ways and the righteous working in big ways. And war is coming. There's no doubt that that's going to happen. But right now, we have to occupy until he comes, until Yeshua comes. And we are doing, we are found doing. When he does come, I want him to find me doing the Father's will in this world. I want him to see me working and doing those things. I hope you have the same spirit. Love you all. Maranatha, everyone. He's coming soon.